Welcome to Inside the Studio. I'm Evan Sanford. Thanks so much for joining us. My guest this week is Pulitzer Prize winning historian and Time Magazine contributing editor John Meacham. He's well known on shows like Meet the Press, Real Time with Bill Maher, and Morning Joe. He spoke on September 21st at the University of Redlands, and it was an honor to have a giant in political news television here inside the studio. Take a look. Being a giant in political television is like being the best restaurant in the hospital. <laughs> But thank you. The bar is very low. I, no, the bar is very I, high but now. I appreciate it. Thank For you. the future of this program, thank the you. bar is very high. Thank you. Well, let's get right to it. In your speech, What Should America Look For in a President? What message were you trying to convey to the Redlands community? Well, we're 49 days away or so from a historic choice. Uh, no matter where you stand in a partisan sense, uh, I think we can clinically agree that we have a choice between one of the most conventionally prepared candidates we can think of and the least conventionally prepared. Uh, this is a battle of uh, the prepared versus the provocateur, uh, the tried and true versus the new and, and, and un, unknown. And I think that uh, what I hoped to convey was that history gives us uh, some guideposts, uh, can illuminate uh, characteristics that we should look for in our presidents. Um, no analysis is ever totally complete. Uh, history is an art, not a science, uh, like life itself. But I, I hope that uh, folks came away thinking in different ways about how to judge these two candidates and those who present themselves down the decades, presuming, of course, the republic survives. <laughs> well, <laughs> a former President H.W. Bush will apparently be voting for Hillary Clinton. This news has just come up in the last few days. In writing your new book about him, Destiny and Power, you got exclusive access to his presidential diary and, and his wife Barbara's as well. So tell us what it was like to get that kind of access. What was remarkable about the Bush project was – it was as close as I'll ever get to being president, uh, It's as cl which is good for America, by the way. Uh, as The diary was an oral diary. It was an audio diary. He dictated uh, into a tape recorder once, twice, three times, sometimes four times a week. Uh, because it was not written, it was much uh, rawer, more uh, honest, I think, in, in many ways. Sometimes he's just so exhausted, you know, you can, you can barely hear him. Uh, sometimes he's exhilarated. Um, you can hear the blades of Marine One and the engines of Air Force One uh, as he does it. Uh, you can hear him slurping his coffee and I think occasionally sipping his martini uh, from, from time to time. But the, the raw data there of an incredibly consequential presidency, what Henry Kissinger called the um, most tumultuous four-year period since Truman, uh, it started with Tiananmen Square, the end of the Cold War, the first Gulf War, the negotiation of NAFTA, uh, an incredible set of, of events, one after another in those four years. I think that the, the first Bush presidency will, will, uh, stand, in, will stand high in historical uh, terms and also simply in its uh, – it was an action-packed four years. He got, he got two years of action in four years. Well, how does Bush's view of the world and government contrast with the current Republican frontrunner? Well, Republican candidate, right? Yeah. Um, well, my view is that the the movement from George Herbert Walker Bush being the Republican president and the Republican nominee 25 years ago to Donald Trump uh, reminds me of what Henry Adams said about Washington to Grant. It disproves Darwin. Um, you know, you it's just not the same universe, really. Uh, they're totally different people. Uh, they come from totally different spheres of life. Uh, George Herbert Walker Bush on his 18th birthday did two things. He graduated from high school and he signed up for the United States Navy. Uh, by the time he was 20, he was being shot down out of the sky over Chichijima in the Pacific, uh, was almost killed. Um, he took time out to build a business career, but by and large, in his 92 years, and today he's sitting in Kennebunkport, Maine, uh, as we speak, in those 92 years, he has done everything he could to put the country first. Uh, he had a very difficult time talking about himself. Part of that was his mother's lesson. His mother uh, very much believed that he should avoid the first-person pronoun. Nobody wants to hear about the great I am. Uh, don't be a braggadocio, George, she would say. So politics was an odd career choice. 
Uh, he went into something where you have to talk about yourself, at least to some degree. Uh, he was never comfortable with it. And we have a Republican nominee now who likes talking about little else. And I just think that it, it shows a, a political shift, but also a cultural shift. Uh, 25 years ago, we, you know, it was the beginning of the cable celebrity culture. Um, the 1992 campaign, which President Bush lost, saw the, the merging of celebrity and political culture with the late night shows with uh, Larry King. Ross Perot came to national prominence in, on cable, on Larry King. Uh, in the way that Trump came to prominence through The Apprentice. Uh, Bill Clinton appealed over the heads of the national press by going on late-night talk shows. Uh, that was a world that George H.W. Bush simply didn't understand. And we've now seen its ultimate, I hope, ultimate manifestation with the rise of Trump. Well, for those that don't know, you recently sat down with Donald Trump and you wrote an article called Gut Check right. about – his reliance on intuition over experience. So what is he really like? Well, he's not as bombastic uh, as he is on the stump, which most people will tell you. Uh, he's engaging, uh, very straightforward. Um, he told me he hadn't read any of my books, but he liked me on TV. And I sort of took How did that, that make you feel? I sort of I, – I, I admired his honesty. To some extent, most politicians would say, oh, I read your book on X and it helped change my life. And you know they aren't telling the truth, but you want to believe them. Uh, he had no such, uh, no such problems. Uh, he answered every question I asked him. Uh, he was uh, very polite. Um, he took uh, two follow-up phone calls on issues. Uh, so I have – in a professional sense, I had a, a perfectly pleasant uh, experience with him. And he's, una he's unabashed and unapologetic about what he's offering. He's offering his personality and his intuition. He has not thought deeply about public policy. His view is that if the experts are so great, why are we in the mess we're in? And if all these other Republican politicians are such great politicians, why is he the Republican nominee? You know, from, from, a, from strictly from a Hobbesian point of view of the war of all against, of all, against all, it's hard to argue with that. Um, whether he should be president or not is, is an entirely separate question. But but I found him to be engaging and um, and straightforward. Uh, I don't think he misled me in any way. He was very straightforward about uh, what he read, what he didn't read, uh, and I admired that. Well, then let me ask you that. Do you think he's fit to be president? I believe that his behavior on the campaign trail has – disqualified him to be president of the United States. Uh, I do not believe he possesses the temperament or the judgment uh, for that job. Probably the biggest takeaway from this election is the mainstreaming of what we're now calling the alt-right movement yeah. and radical candidates like Trump, Cruz and Carson took the Republican primary by storm. And do you think that this is a one-time occurrence or do you think it's scarred the party forever? Well. This is an old hymn with new verses. Um, there's been tension in the Republican Party, in the Democratic Party too, but since we're talking about the Republicans, uh, really since the Eisenhower administration. Movement conservatism, uh, which in many ways had its greatest early success with the nomination of Barry Goldwater, uh, its greatest success with the nomination and election of President Reagan. Uh, grew out of the 50s, grew out of the, the, the trauma, the paranoia, the tensions of the Cold War, the anxiety about uh, the overreaching of the federal government and the New Deal. Uh, Bill Rusher, uh, who was the publisher of National Review, uh, Bill Buckley was its editor, uh, said that the basically the conservative movement grew out of reaction to the Eisenhower administration because so many conservatives believe that the first Republican to succeed Roosevelt and Truman would undo the New Deal, undo the fair deal. Eisenhower was actually more of a classic Burkean conservative. He believed that you accepted the world as you found it and tried to modestly reform it. True conservatism as opposed to movement conservatism is more about preservation and moderate reform as opposed to revolution. In that sense, Ronald Reagan was not a classic Burkean conservative. Um, Reagan believed in what Thomas Paine said, that we have it in our power to begin the world over again. 
True conservatives don't believe that. Um, so this fight has been going on for 60, 70 years now. Uh, what is fascinating uh, and the life of George H.W. Bush was totally tied up in this. Uh, he was from the Northeast. He moves to Texas. Texas is a more conservative state than the Northeast. So he was always kind of a, a man without a, a real home in the party itself as, as it changed. I will point out it's, it's worth noting that the 1980 platform was the first time that the Republican platform had not supported the Equal Rights Amendment. So the the shift sharply to the right is a fairly recent phenomena in, in historical terms. Now, what does the Republican Party do now? If Trump loses, I think the way forward is a little bit easier. Uh, to some extent, if he wins, I don't know what the hell they do. Uh, that's a technical historical term. Um, if he loses, then the so-called establishment – uh, will have to decide what tack they want to take. I suspect what Senator Cruz will do, and I think he's already running again, will be arguing that the mistake they made was nominating someone who is fundamentally a Democrat. Trump has been a Democrat. He's given to Democrats um, that there was an impulse in the country, but it found the wrong messenger. That will be the Cruz argument. Uh, it'll be fascinating to see whether there's a Kasich argument, that part of the party, uh, I don't think Governor Bush will be back in that mix. Um, but there's also the chance that the party will split in half. Parties tend to die or change rapidly and radically, I should say, uh, change radically when they fail to achieve majority consensus on the defining issue of a given era. So the Whigs couldn't agree about slavery. They fall apart. The Democrats could not agree on civil rights. They fundamentally changed in the 1960s. The Republicans changed fundamentally in the 1960s um, as well. And so do we have a third party? I, I, I don't know. Um, part of this depends. Part of the, the, the X factor here is to what extent is the Trump base an ongoing feature of Republican politics? Is, is this a one-time thing, or are they now here to stay? Would you mind staying around for just a few more minutes? We just have to take a quick break. Sure. Thank you so much. More inside the studio in just a moment. Stay tuned. Hi, I'm Evan Sanford, station manager. I'm Noah Sylvester, assistant station manager. And I'm Cassidy Mason, program director. At KDOG, we are the voice of the student body of the University of Redlands. Through music and spoken word broadcast, we provide a place for open forum discussion and a place to share in the enjoyment of music of all kinds. Our mission is to deliver new music and inform the University of Redlands community on news, events, and fundraising while inspiring the student body to get involved in the different social engagements that the university provides. KDOG keeps the campus up to date on current events, social affairs, and sporting events by broadcasting directly from the station to listeners on and off campus. At KDOG, team members research and develop a wide array of skill sets, including writing, public speaking, and marketing. At KDOG, we educate, innovate, and collaborate. We, we are KDOG College, College Radio. Radio. Yeah. Welcome back to Inside the Studio. All right, so we were talking about the Republicans, uh, and many feel that this is the nastiest presidential campaign that we've ever seen. But isn't there a precedent for this kind of behavior in campaigns past? Oh, sure, sure. I mean, it was, uh, you know, Andrew Jackson threatened to shoot people. Um, so, uh, but so has Trump. <laughs> yeah, well, well, that's a good point, too. Uh, you know, in, in 1800, there were ads, advertisements and newspapers that said you could have Adams and God or Jefferson and no God. Um, no, the negativity is not really the issue, it seems to me. Uh, that comes and goes. Uh, what is the issue is the fundamental offer for the voter. Uh, and we have not had a major party nominee in modern times defined as the 20th century or so 
20th and 21st century, who has been as outside the mainstream of political and cultural norms as Trump. And that's one of the reasons for his appeal, right? Uh, we all have the vices of our virtues and the virtues of our vices. Uh, he is the nominee because a significant number of people believe that the social, political, cultural, economic order is broken and that you need someone from outside the political, social, economic, and cultural order to fix it. Uh, and that's 40 percent of the country. And if you're a Jeffersonian, Jacksonian Democrat, lowercase d, you do have to wrestle with the question – is 40 percent of the country simply mad, uh, I mean in, in the old sense of it, are they crazy, or do they have a point? And I think that to glibly dismiss the Trump support as misguided uh, does a disservice to the underlying issues that whoever wins is going to have to deal with. Are you concerned about the lack of issues being discussed in this campaign? Not especially because – I. Again, maybe I'm maybe this because I follow this so so closely. I, I think people basically get it. Uh, I think they get that Secretary Clinton would be a third Obama term uh, in many ways. Um, I think they get that Trump would just be like the Hangover Part Four. You know, you just don't know what's going to happen, and you're probably going to end up in Mike Tyson's living room. <laughs> That analogy will forever be in my head. That's my goal. That's my goal <laughs> is to give you these analogies. Let's talk about the Democrats now. Uh, is the establishment, in your opinion, do you think the establishment is truly becoming out of touch with a younger generation of voters across the country? And the Democrats? Yeah. I think Bernie Sanders gets credit for fixing that. Uh, I think Senator Clinton might be, but I think Senator Sanders, with his emphasis on student debt, on the cost of education – uh, I think did her an enormous service by by putting that issue front and center. Um, it's hard for me to imagine that uh, younger voters, given the demography of the country, given their essential social views, which are largely socially libertarian, uh, largely unaffiliated, non-affiliated, by, either by party or by um, uh, religious institution, hard for me to see them being big Trump people. Uh, I would imagine they would be Clinton people. Uh, they might have some attraction to Gary Johnson or Jill Stein. Uh, but young people tend not to vote. That is the lower – that is the lowest cohort uh, traditionally. And there are lots of people uh, – my friend Joe Scarborough jokes about this a lot. There are lots of people who believed that their political fate would be determined as soon as the young kids got out and those people are now not in office. Uh, so – uh, I think that the Democrats, largely because of Senator Sanders, are in a better position than they would be otherwise. Do you think that this feeling that Democratic officials aren't progressive enough or they're too complacent uh, is a push for a more active and progressive party? Sure. Uh, but I'm always reminded about what FDR said. He had a meeting of young uh, progressives at the White House in the 30s, and they didn't think the New Deal was moving fast enough and he said that uh, – challenged a young questioner. He said, you know, young man, the longer I've been in this office, the more I've learned that you can't get what you want by just shouting from the rooftops. And, uh, you know, I think that Secretary Clinton embodies uh, a kind of pragmatic progressivism. And uh, President Obama uh, did not start out as progressive as he has ended up. Remember, he was not – strong on the gun issue. He was not strong on marriage equality. Uh, he uh, did not support a mandate, universal health care mandate in the first in the first campaign. So, you know, to win national elections, it helps to be closer to the center. And then as the term goes on, you can, you can push a little bit farther. That doesn't play very well in big rallies, but it, it's the practical nature of it. What do you think that a shakeup like this, whatever the outcome is, uh, could mean for future elections and the course of our nation's history. Well, it's it's there's always a big presidential campaigns matter always because of the nature of them. But this is a terribly significant one uh, because of the alternative. Um, I think if Secretary Clinton becomes president, we know roughly what the country will look like in four to eight years. 
If Mr. Trump were to win, I'm not sure we know the answer to that. A recent AP poll states that voters uh, across the board are feeling disconnected and hopeless um, this election season, and, and that's felt on campus as well. Throughout classes, we hear this all the time from other students in the class. Do you think that there's any glimmer of hope for young voters especially to not feel like this is just a choice between the lesser of two evils? Not between now and November 8th. Uh, This is going to to be something you look forward. Uh, This is the choice between uh, two unpopular candidates. You know, I have have a hard time referring to either one of them as evil. Uh, I I don't like that. I know you don't mean it literally. Um, But I I, I think that we tend to get the politics we deserve. And if young folks, if middle-aged folks, if – upper middle-aged folks, which is where I'm quickly heading, uh, really believe that there needs to be a change, then they have to get in the arena not once every four years but all the way through. And you need to start running for office. You need to start understanding the party system. Uh, You can't subcontract it to a political class and then expect that political class to be responsive to your needs when you decide to tune in. And just finally, this is just something that I'm very interested in. What do you think, as a journalist, what do you think that the news will look like in 10 years or even five years for that matter just because of the landscape of the media changing? What's your opinion? I expect you to to write me in my nursing home (laughs) and and tell me. uh, Send it it with the tapioca. Um, (laughs) And the jello. And the jello, yeah. You know, I don't know. I think we're at the uh, – I think we're at the – to quote Churchill, we're at the end of the beginning of the revolution. I don't think we're at the, anywhere near the beginning of the end of it. Um, there's an interesting survey out this very week uh, about uh, where people get their news. Uh, television is very high. Uh, social media is about one in five. Uh, I know that students I teach uh, at Vanderbilt, uh, the University of the South uh, – I'm on the board at my old high school. Uh, asked them recently where they got their information, and a lot of it is coming. In. It's it's the influx of headlines on social media. So the danger of that is that you are selecting those who send you the headlines. So you're not necessarily encountering different sets of data or different points of view. I bet that changes ultimately. Um, uh, my central worry is about the economics of the business. The eco- it's very expensive to have people in Syria. It's very expensive to have people digging into the Trump Foundation or digging into the Clinton Foundation. Uh, these are not um, easily uh, done things. And so we have to find a way. In the same way we get the politics we deserve, I think we get the media we deserve. Uh, we have to pay subscription prices. You know, We have to uh, contribute our, our might to the, to the enterprise uh, or you're going to end up with um, an economically disastrous media that's not going to be able to give us what we need. It's easy to see why he's a giant in political news television. My thanks again to John Meacham and to you for joining us again this week. That's all we have for you today. Until next time, I'm Evan Sanford and this is Inside the Studio.